Welcome back to Understand and Respond. It's a very special time of year. Very special season. When we give expensive gifts to each other, we max out as much as we can afford on our credit cards and bank accounts to try and show people how much we love them. We want to give good gifts. I watch television and the commercials show expensive exotic automobiles with those fancy red bows all around them and dancing around in the highways covered with snow. I see advertisements for people with very shiny diamond rings and diamond earrings and diamond pendants and gifts that are being suggested for people to buy during the Christmas season. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you can afford those kind of gifts, that's fine. But if you want to understand what Christmas is, you have to go further into the story than that. It's not just a picture of a little baby in a manger, which that certainly is Christmas, but that story just does not make sense for why a tradition has endured for 2,000 years. Christmas is something that we celebrate around the world because of a greater gift, a deeper and more meaningful and more costly gift than anything you have ever given. If you totaled up everything you've ever given in your whole life, it wouldn't amount to the value of what we're talking about here. Maybe we ought to just take a minute and, and explain what the greatest gift really is. You see, it's a gift you can't give yourself. Well, some people give gifts to themselves. If my husband isn't going to give me what I really want for Christmas, I'll go get it myself. If my wife doesn't give me what I like most of all for Christmas, I'll get it myself. If my parents don't love me enough to get me what I want. I'll just spend the money on myself. But you can't get this one for yourself. You just can't. It's called reconciliation. Reconciliation means you have been put back into your pop proper place you have been restored to your original place. Let me explain how that, it happens in the story of Luke as he tells the story of Jesus in the seventh chapter. And there's a very wealthy, very powerful, very well-respected man, very godly. It's not that he's a bad person by any means. He, he lives by the law, he, he, he knows how to behave, and he knows how to keep it together. And he has been consistent and faithful. Now he has asked Jesus to come into his home so they can have a conversation, just like we're having here. You know, maybe he even had some coffee in the coffee cup. And they're having a conversation. But there is a distraction. There's this lady who lives in the godly man's home, in the hometown, that has a very bad reputation. And you know what? It's well deserved. Over the years, she's had a chance to reform herself over and over again. She's been scolded and reprimanded. She's been given one last chance to get her life straightened around. And just seems like every time that happens, she falls back into her sinful habits. The godly man who had asked Jesus into his home didn't really appreciate her being there. But she'd come in along with Jesus and from the very minute that she had entered the home and saw Jesus reclining, as they did in those days, they didn't sit on sofas, they kind of had mats on the floor and you know things they could 
cushions they could lean against and that kind of stuff. But it was a, a reclining on the floor kind of an arrangement back then. They didn't sit in chairs around a dining table. So she was easily able to approach Jesus and she began to kiss his feet as they extended out on the floor. He was talking with the very godly host that he had uh, had welcomed him into his home. And, and yet there was this lady with uh, an obvious history of problems, one right after the other. And there she was, crying, the tears from her eyes falling on Jesus' feet. And in an effort to dry them, she takes her long hair and begins to use her own hair to dry the tears from his feet. Sort of embarrassing, isn't it? Sort of strange. It's not the way normal people operate. And then it was even more embarrassing. She had brought with her into this banquet room a jar of very, very expensive perfume. It was called nard. It was very, very expensive. And she broke open the bottle that was very tightly sealed because an expensive perfume didn't want to be put in a, in a fragile container because it would leak out, it would, it would evaporate, and then you would lose the, the fragrance of the perfume. So she broke open the seals and she poured out the perfume on his feet. And then the tears and the perfume dried them with her hair. And the man who had wanted to talk with Jesus, wanted to learn from Jesus, wanted to hear from Jesus, wanted to understand something of what Jesus was doing just wanted her to go away. Just, just leave us alone. You're embarrassing everybody. You're embarrassing yourself. Jesus turned to his host and he said, I'd like to tell you something. Oh, that's why he didn't invite him. Sure. <laughs> I, please, please share with me something that's very important. Okay. Jesus said, let me share this with you. There was a story, a story of two men who owned uh, a wealthy man, a money lender, a lot of money. One owed 500 denarii to the money lender. Uh, a denarii in those days was sort of the symbol of how much money you could earn in one day. Uh, individual denarii isn't too bad. I mean, if you had just one day's wages, uh, you could probably go, if you use that one day's wages to pay back the loan, you could go two days without buying food. You could go a little while without your necessities of life, and, and you'd be able to pay back the money. But this man owed 500 days wages, or denarii, daily wages. 500 denarii. The other one owed 50 denarii. 50 denarii. 50 is just a little short of two months. Uh, at one point somebody told me I was going to have to go two months between paychecks. I about had a stress attack. Two months between paychecks. Almost. Wow, how do you ever survive that? I mean, if he had to pay back a loan of 50 denarii, that's 50 days wages before he could be able to save one for himself. That's a lot of money. But the other one, 500 denarii, that's a year and a half. A year and a half of working for, for somebody else without being able to take a penny for your own needs, your own family. 
Who could afford to do that? So it ended up being a lot of money. And neither one of them had any money to pay the loan back. The money lender, must have been Christmas, <laughs> didn't have Christmas in Jesus' day yet, but he was in a generous spirit, I guess. And he gave both men a gift. He forgave both of them their loans. I guess they sort of got lucky on that one, didn't they? No more year and a half without being able to buy bread. No more 50 days before you could take care of your family again. They had their lives back. I mean, they had their lives back. Wow! There's hope again. There's a chance to live again. Not be trapped. Not be hooked by past mistakes or past problems. It was a great story. Jesus stopped in the middle of the story and he says, okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. Which one of the two men was more grateful, was more thankful, was more joy-filled with the gift that they had received? And the man thought about it for a minute. And he said, well, I imagine it was the man who received the forgiveness of the loan that was so huge compared to the one who had his 50 days of wages forgiven. Jesus said, I think you're right. The man who was forgiven so very much, who had gotten himself so terribly trapped, was a lot more grateful than the one who had the smaller loan forgiven. Well, he said, let's make the application. When I came into your house, the custom was that there'd be a servant, a, a, a one of the lower servants in the house. It was a, a menial job. It wasn't a very nice, pleasant job. Um, they didn't have paved streets in all the streets and highways, and they had a lot of animals and pets and that kind of stuff walking up and down the passageways and streets in their communities. And so there was a lot of smelly stuff that would be better if it stayed in the street. And so there was usually a, a servant person who would be at the door who would take some, you know, a bowl of water and would rinse off the residue off of the people's feet who were walking from the street outside and coming into the clean home. You, you didn't want to bring that stuff in there. They would just rinse off the dust off of the feet. It wasn't a very pleasant job. It kind of smelled bad. You know, got your hands dirty. Once you'd done that for a while, you wanted to be promoted to let some other little guy take over that job because that was one of the more unpleasant jobs to be done in the household. Jesus said, when, not, when I came in, you didn't have someone assigned to make our visit more pleasant by washing the dust and dirt and accumulation of smelly stuff off my feet. But since I laid down here, this woman has done nothing but wash my feet with her tears and now with this expensive perfume. When I came in, the custom was for someone who was respected or someone who was admired or distinguished, that you would reach up and give them a kiss. It wasn't a romantic kiss like we would have today, but it was a symbol of respect. He said, when I came into your home, you didn't show me that official kind of 
appreciation or respect or admiration. But from the time I laid down here to talk with you and share this meal together, she's done nothing but kiss my feet. So, who do you suppose has been forgiven more? The person who has shown no real gratitude, thankfulness, or the one who has not even stopped weeping and pouring out her tears in gratitude. Therefore I tell you, Jesus says to the righteous man, many are her sins and they have all been forgiven for she has loved much. But the person who has been, give, been forgiven very little, loves very little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Of course, that caused quite a stir because the only place in that day where a person's sins could be forgiven was in the temple. And if you offered the right sacrifice, you could have the forgiveness. This woman, of course, would never have been allowed in the temple. It was only for men. It was only for husbands of men, of, of women, who would go in and offer sacrifices for the whole family. And, of course, she probably had no man um, to go in and take a sacrifice in for her. So she wouldn't have had any chance to get the forgiveness in the temple. She had to be clean and she was obviously a person with a bad reputation, so there had been a guard at the gate of the temple and never would have let her in. She was not a person respectable enough to be allowed in the temple. So she was cut off from having any chance of having the official way of having her sins forgiven. But because she believed in this person, Jesus, because she received his tender mercy, because he told her that the alienation between God and sin had been taken away and she was now reconciled to her Father in heaven. Nothing stood between this lady and God's grace and peace and blessing. Everything that had happened before had been wiped away. Everything was gone. And she could start over clean, reconciled to God. That was the blessing. That was the blessing of Christmas. We don't have a temple. It just doesn't happen today. We don't have a place to go to sacrifice. We may go off on a pilgrimage someplace on a, um, a, a you know, an extended tour to try and show our devotion. There are sites where you're supposed to go and pray and show your faithfulness and your eagerness to be reconciled. But It doesn't happen for everybody. It, it can't be that everybody goes. It just doesn't happen that way. So what about these people that Jesus was referring to who had so much to be forgiven for and no, so little hope of ever receiving it? Well, there he sat, right there, and said, I'm here to make sure that you can have reconciliation. You needed it real bad. You got to have it to be able to live in something other than just a state of total despair. You can't forgive yourself. It's a simple fact of life. You can buy yourself a Christmas present, but if you've done things that were wrong, and people have been hurt, and people have been disappointed, 
and people have been crushed. And people who have loved you have had their hearts broken. You can't forgive yourself for those things. I'm sorry. It's beyond your power. You don't have enough money. You can't borrow enough money. You can't beg enough money to buy yourself a Christmas present of forgiveness. That has to come from the one person who has the power to forgive. Jesus, you see, did two things during his ministry here, during his life ministry. He healed and he forgave. He healed and showed his power over this creation and he forgave. And finally, at the cross, even from the cross in those last moments of his life, he said, Father, forgive all of these people. They don't have a clue as to what they've done. Forgive them. Because I ask you to forgive them. I'm the one appealing to you, Father in heaven, to forgive them for what they have done to me. And then he was resurrected to show he had even more authority than anybody had ever imagined over this world, over life, over death, over sin. You see, the godly man should have known that. Because in other places where it talks about this banquet that they had, <coughs> the man was given a name. We know what his name is. His name was Simon the leper. He was a godly man. So what does Simon the leper mean? It means that, number one, he couldn't have had a banquet if he'd actually been a leper. All right? He may have had leprosy. He may have been a godly man who came down with an incurable disease. But if he was still showing the signs of the disease of leprosy, he would have been driven out of the community. He'd have been living out in the uninhabited areas of the community, in caves and places where people didn't hang out and you couldn't get close to him and, and there was no way he could ever have a party in a house because leprosy was forbidden to be inside the community. So how did he stop being a leper. And all that was left was the name that he was left with. The Simon, the man who used to be the leper. The only lepers in the Bible that we're told about that were able to return home, restored, healed, renewed, allowed to have a life again, allowed to have a family again, allowed to live in a community again, were ones that Jesus healed. Could it be that Simon the leper, who had received healing from Jesus for his physical body, somehow hadn't understood that Jesus had come to do even more than that? He said, I have come to seek and to save those that were lost. If you've had leprosy, you know what it means to lose your life. Your family life is done. Your health is gone. Your future is canceled. You don't have anything left. You're done. Just waiting for the undertaker. But somehow he had his life returned. You see, 
Jesus offered the same gift, the same loving offering to the lady who had sinned so much. If you need forgiveness, if you need God's grace, if you need to understand that God loves you enough to forgive and restore and be reconciled with you, this is the time. This is the moment when you can call out to him and say, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned against everybody that loved me. I have sinned against the people who gave so much to me. I have sinned against you. Please forgive me. There isn't any better gift that anyone can give you than what Jesus Christ brought into that room that day to that lady who needed it so badly and appreciated it so deeply. I hope that you can claim your gift that God has prepared for you as well. God bless you.